The problem with myths is, by definition, they're widely held beliefs that are rarely questioned. So here are my top 10 garden mythbusters. It's always been perceived wisdom that you put gravel in the base of the pot to help the drainage. I've been doing it for years until I heard about Dr. Mark Riger from the University of Georgia. He has proven this is actually detrimental and it is not good for drainage. And he proved it by really actually measuring the amount of water held by a pot of compost. And he compared a long, thin pot to a fatter, dumpier pot. The analogy is a sponge. If you have a tall, thin sponge and you fill it with water, a lot of water will drain away very fast. If you have the same sponge and you fill it with water and you put it on its side, it will hold a lot more water. So if you've got a plant container and you put gravel in the base, you're effectively making it more dumpy. So it's going to retain more moisture and not drain so well. Added to this, Water doesn't move well from a layer of compost to a layer of gravel, so you're compounding the effect. So the simple takeaway lesson is never put gravel to improve drainage in the bottom of your containers. Even my mother, who was a very keen gardener and a commercial horticulturalist, used to dig the beds every winter. She loved that look of freshly dug soil, but it's so bad. When you dig the soil, you actually do far more harm than good. In the top 70 to 100 mil of topsoil, you is absolutely teeming with fungi, bacteria, all sorts of microorganisms which are really healthy. They're all part of this rich diome. As soon as you dig them, you disrupt them and you reduce the populations of these great, great things. So you really should not do that at all. You must just leave them as they are. If you want to enrich it, the best thing is just to put organic matter on the top and let the worms pull it down. And they will do that and aerate the soil far better than you can do with any digging. Another bad reason for digging the soil is that you bring weed seeds to the surface where they get light and they germinate. So you increase your weed population, not reduce it. And finally, if you've got perennial weeds, if you chop the soil around, you are basically propagating. So from one root of cooch grass or another noxious weed, you'll break it up into little bits and you'll have hundred more to take their place. So please don't dig the soil. Everywhere you go and you see newly planted trees, they've nearly always got massively great tall timber stakes. But in fact, stakes are really detrimental to tree growth. What happens when you stake a tree? You have the tree tie around the tree and the stake, and the trunk of the tree actually gets thicker above the tree tie than below it. Which if you think about it in the nature, it's exactly the reverse of what should be if the trunk should taper as it goes up. The other thing is when you stake a tree, the tree cannot move in the wind. And if you think of a sapling that's just grown naturally, the wind buffets it around. And as it moves, the roots will be lightly pruned below ground and that will encourage them to grow out further, which is all to the good. Now, obviously, if you're planting a large tree and you're on the top of a mountain and it's really windy, that tree needs something to make it stay up. But what I always try and do is to I plant I try and plant a tree that you can get in the ground and keep upright without any stake at all. That is the best scenario. And here I've managed to actually plant quite tall trees, even standards with no stake at all, and they're absolutely fine. If you really have to have a tree stake because you are on the side of that windy mountain, then do it using a stake that's just a third of the height of the tree. So the stake and the trunk are tied just quite low down at the base of the tree. And then you do get natural movement. And as soon as you can take away that stake, maybe after a year, remove it and then let it grow all on its own. If you're planting trees, it really does pay to be patient. If you can buy a small tree for a fraction of the cost of a big tree, you'll find the small tree establishes much quicker, grows away faster and will soon overtake the big tree. 
This is because when you move a bigger tree, it's a much more of an upset to its system. So it goes into a check and it sits there and it sulks for a few years and then slowly it gets into its stride and gets going again. But you never get such a good natural shape as to compare to when you planted a small tree, which just grows away relatively unhindered. So the end result is nearly always better by planting a small tree rather than the big tree. For a small tree, you can buy a tree easily, a little transplant for about 50p if it's deciduous or maybe under. But you could easily spend 50 pounds or even 500 pounds on a far, far bigger tree. Okay, you have the instant effect, but think how many more little trees you could plant for the size of that one bigger tree. So when you plant a tree, you really do not want to put more than a 40 centimetres depth of soil in the bottom of the hole, because below that, the bacteria, the aerobic bacteria, they're the bacteria that like oxygen, will not get any oxygen. And so you get anaerobic bacteria developing. These anaerobic bacteria don't need oxygen, but they actually produce methane and ammonia. Now this becomes quite toxic, the tree cannot take up oxygen and so it starves. So you really need to just put a maximum of 40 centimetres of soil in a hole. Now when they were planting the trees at the Olympic Park, these were trees with a circumference of a metre, so they were massive. Tim O'Hare supervised this, he's a leading UK soil scientist, and so what he put below the 40 centimetres was compaction resistant subsoils and washed sands. So actually that's what they bedded the root on. The other thing to think of is when you're digging your hole you don't want to make it too wide either, you just want to make it the actual width that you need to get those roots in because if you put in really good topsoil into that little bit, the roots will not venture out and go into the surrounding soil, which is what you want to get a healthy tree. So you just make the hole the minimum size and you backfill with a similar material to is surrounding it. Recently, because of the outcry about herbicides, quite a few councils were starting to use vinegar as a form of weed control. Vinegar is acetic acid, and when you put it on the plant at a concentration of 100% even, you will find that the leaves do in fact bleach and die back. But you will see that the plant actually grows straight back because it's a contact herbicide. It will only kill the parts of the plant that it touches, and then all the bits below the ground means it regenerates again. So it really is pretty useless. Now, if you attack the roots and you actually poured neat vinegar all over the roots, it might be a slightly better story, but just think how you'll be contaminating the soil with all that neat vinegar poured over the soil. So forget it. Do not bother with vinegar. Many people advocate using Epsom salts to apply to plants to improve their growth. Epsom salts can be added on as a liquid feed, it can be added on as a solid fertiliser or as a dilute foliar feed to go in through the leaves. It's called Epsom salts because it's mined near Epsom originally in England. It contains magnesium and sulphate, but it's very, very rare for soils to be short of magnesium. If your soil is short of magnesium, it's probably quite acidic and you need to add dolomite lime to make it more neutral. Then you need to add magnesium as well. But that's quite rare, as I said. Sulphur, though, it is slightly more often that soils are deficient in this. In fact, some people think that sulphate is the fourth most important nutrient after NPK, nitrogen, potassium and phosphate, which are the three most important elements. So if your soil is short of sulphate, then you can add sulphur chips, which will also make the soil more acidic, which can be quite helpful if you want to grow rhododendrons, or you could add some Epsom salts. But as a general cure-all, don't just go and bung on the Epsom salts. It won't do any good. Talking to sound engineer Andy Hetherington, hedges do absolutely nothing to help absorb or deflect the sound. People always think that a lovely big fat evergreen hedge will really absorb or take away a lot of road noise or whatever they're trying to hide, but it really doesn't. 
The way it does work a bit is out of sight, out of mind. And the fact that you can't see the point source really does help a lot. If you want to actually try and mask the noise a bit, then you have to really think of something solid. Maybe one of those sound absorbing timber fences, maybe a wall, maybe a mound of soil. But you have to plan it quite carefully. And because sound travels in waves like light, if you imagine a point source of light put over the other side of your neighboring fence with your neighbor, the light will still travel over it and you'll be aware of it. What you can do to help mask the noise is you can always have a noise of a fountain or something like that, and that will just take your mind off the main noise that you're trying to hide. And that can be really, really helpful. And you have to remember that actually wind carries sound quite a lot. So maybe if the sound from a road is being blown into your garden, you could actually plant a shelter belt of trees and that could mask it quite considerably. But if you think a hedge is going to mask the noise, you've got no chance. It's been perceived wisdom that if you put fresh green waste on top of the soil, the soil will actually become depleted in nitrogen as it breaks down the green waste into organic matter. But many topsoil scientists disagree with this nowadays because they say if your soil is rich in fungi, microorganisms, worms and things and you leave the green waste on the top of the soil they will gradually break it down and it will not deplete the soil from nitrogen. So what we can take from this is you can spend more time leading on your spade and less time digging. Salt used to be used as a herbicide, but actually it is pretty toxic. They used to use about a cupful of salt per square meter on asparagus beds. And in England, it was even approved for use as a herbicide in sugar beet back in 1985. But actually it is pretty toxic. People sometimes used to use it as a contact herbicide. But if you actually spray salt water onto the plants, it will kill the bits it touches but then perhaps not the roots and they'll regenerate. The problem is if you put salt on your beds and the solution around the roots is a stronger salt than in the plant's actual roots, then the water from the plant's roots will leach out through osmosis into the soil, which is exactly the reverse of what should happen. So the plant wilts. And it's exactly the same if you put lots of chemical fertilizers around a plant's roots. The salts in the soil are stronger in the soil than in the plant and the plant wilts. The actual constituent elements of salt, sodium and chlorine, are both pretty toxic in quite small concentrations too. So you really don't want to be putting salt onto your flower beds. When I'm gardening, I like to question everything that I do. There's so much more research coming nowadays from all over the world that you can actually make your gardening much more effective and more enjoyable. <laughs>